Onision. That name probably just sent a shiver down your spine. For anyone who somehow didn't experience that feeling, beginning to explain his controversies and crimes would make for a very long video. So I recommend you check out Elise Yeezy's many videos on him to learn about why this guy sucks. I think she's very entertaining and she's also done reviews on all of his books as well. But watch this video first, alright? You're already here, so let's not contribute to those commitment issues of yours, alright buddy? Today we're reading one of his books and even though I disapprove Proof of Onision, I've done my best to be unbiased in this review and to give the analysis genuine thought. After all, we are talking about Onision's book, not Onision. Even though the main characters in his works are often unabashed self-inserts that sometimes he forgets to write the character name of and writes his own name instead, but I I'm getting ahead of myself here. I believe that when you are reviewing any book, it's important to approach it without bias. Keep in mind, that doesn't mean approaching the book without information. So you are formally informed that Onision sucks and he writes about as well as I did in the third grade, informed only by his own experiences. You are also informed that this book contains the following content, sexual assault, child sexual assault, and child abuse, among many others. This book is very edgy, but I mostly talk about those subjects in the video, so viewer discretion for those is advised. With that out of the way, let us go on a journey together. A journey through a journal, one might say because this is why I hate you by Onision, yes he uses his internet handle as a pin name, is the journal of a hateful young man, to quote the synopsis. Actually, let's read that synopsis together, shall we? Within these pages wait violent fights, disease, death, controversy, sexuality, tragedy, and crime. This journal documents a hateful young man's path to darkness. Many events that occur are based on real events. You will find many moments from the author's own life sewn into the life of Arthur Gale. That's funny, I said author instead of Arthur. You can only go so far before all hope of return is lost. This book reaches that point and goes even further. James represented the light. Arthur is the dark. There is no hero. There is only Arthur. Ignoring the uh, very reassuring spelling and grammatical errors, we already have some thematic promises that I will be evaluating later on in my own analysis of the book, namely themes of darkness, violence, tragedy, and sexuality. And on Goodreads, this is why I hate you lies amongst the infamous rank of books like Handbook for Mortals, Empress Teresa, and most indicative of them all, Trigger Warning, giving us an idea of what to expect. Side note, I think James is a character from another book of his because there's no one named James here. And I know it's true, but I almost wish he just wrote the wrong name in the description. Without further ado, let's begin our usual reviewing ritual of summary analysis and finally, opinion. The journal begins with our main character, 17-year-old Arthur Gale, lamenting about how he feels alone in life. He has no one to talk to, not for a lack of trying, and he is just generally very pessimistic about the world around him and holds a lot of nihilistic beliefs. He aims to journal his thoughts to clear his head and perhaps to turn it into a book to publish one day, which is what we are reading now. His school life is mostly made up of silence because he doesn't see much value in speech and has a lot of disdain for many of his classmates, which we will touch on in specific later because who he hates and why he hates them says a lot about Arthur's character. We will talk about someone he hates right now though because Arthur spends a few pages discussing how he feels about his father and his stepmom. She's his dad's girlfriend, really, but stepmom is less confusing, so we'll call her that. Arthur's mother died, and he harbors a lot of resentment towards his father and sees his stepmom as an ill-suited replacement. He also resents anything that has to do with these two people or their beliefs, including vegetarians, theists, sport fans, and fat people. And it seems that a lot of his prejudices stem from his intense hatred and trauma surrounding his father and his dead mother. But Arthur's life is not all horrible. He gets a girlfriend named Ash he says he doesn't feel a particular attraction to her, but he does seem to like her and can see a future with her in his, um, own strange way. Until, of course, another boy at his school harasses her and he decides to get revenge by beating him up. In the fight, he breaks his arm and the police are called to the school because he had to go to the hospital. Arthur is very mad lad about it all and gets suspended from school. As any normal person would, Ashley distances herself but eventually comes around him again and he says it's because he is an alpha male who displayed his violent side for her the way that lions do. You know, instead of just 
displaying that he has a huge capacity for violence. He also displays this alpha male champion attitude to his schoolmates by returning with a bang. Quote, every other person at school has been looking at me nervously for the past few days. Today their looks could be in response that I painted half my face like a skeleton. It could also be that I wore the same trench coat I had on when I broke John's arm. I didn't even wash my own blood off of it yet. It could also be the silver tooth I got to replace the one John knocked out of my face." End quote. Predictably, this doesn't fly with administration and Arthur is threatened with expulsion by his cartoonishly evil principal, who insinuates he wants to expel him for fear he's going to, uh, make some basement tapes. We'll put it that way. It's always fun when YouTube puts a Wikipedia article under my videos, but we're not trying to get that, okay? Sometime later, Arthur has a fight with his dad because his stepmom wants to go somewhere for the weekend and they drag him along instead of letting him stay with Ashley. And I mean a physical fight. His father chokes him out, he kicks the guy, cops get called the whole nine yards. The scene is kind of upsetting because it's just straight up child abuse and Arthur only defends himself. He runs away and thinks, quote, we had already driven so far from anyone I knew, I had no money on me and because of that, I felt I had no hope. After that, he sits down on a curb and cries. It's here where we begin to realize that at least Arthur's hatred for his dad and his stepmom could be justified or at least explained because they both are perfectly fine with physically abusing him and he has a meltdown when the cops approach him. He ends up getting sent to juvie and to further describe his home life, he writes, in that cell, I felt safe. I felt happier than I had in my own home. A prison cell felt more welcoming than living two doors away from my father, end quote. We have a time skip then and a change of mood after Arthur applies for and is accepted into the military. Unfortunately, it meant leaving Ashley, but he made the decision because it meant leaving his father behind too. However, now he faces abuse of sergeants and soon finds himself feeling the same lack of autonomy he felt under his father's care. At one point, he's forced to humiliate his peers and it deeply disturbs him to not only feel himself in the point of view of the abuser, but to see them looking at him from the perspective that Arthur himself had previously had. His conflicted emotions about the entire situation cause him to stress and only reaffirm the hateful biases he's had his entire life about how life is meaningless and just more the same. But throughout the dark parts of military training and service, Arthur meets a girl named Corey, someone who's excited to be around him, just like the now distant Ashley was. With Corey's first admittance of love, though, comes terrible news from Ashley, who has resurfaced from radio silence to ask Arthur to come back after her younger brother is shot in a school shooting. Because this is an Onision book and we have to have one of those. Ashley copes with the death in a way and repeatedly takes advantage of Arthur's pity for her and we begin to get the inklings of an attempt at a love triangle and, dare I say, some foreshadowing for a twist to be revealed later. More comes between him and Corey as he is deployed to South Korea and she is not. There, Arthur goes through more training and contemplates more on how easy it is to abuse other people and we see him slipping dangerously close to fulfilling the next step in the cycle of abuse. Arthur is also dangerously infected with mad lad disease and beats up a trainer. He immediately becomes involved with another woman, Rachel, calling himself disgusting from hopping from woman to woman, but at the same time, not really feeling it or caring about it too much. What he does feel, however, is anger when another man corners Rachel and threatens to assault her. And as is Arthur's way, he... <laughs> He literally blacks out and wakes up in the hospital with a broken neck and fingers, as well as some hefty plot armor in the form of one Lieutenant Colonel Haas. Haas really has no other purpose in the story besides protecting Arthur in Korea, so I didn't mention him yet and I won't mention him again. And because things can only go up from here, Corey is deployed to South Korea too and becomes Rachel's roommate. The book now consistently calls Rachel Booty, which is Arthur's very not racist nickname for his black girlfriend, but I don't know her that well. Well, so we'll uh, stick to given names for now. And instead of being hurt that Arthur has a new girlfriend, Corey is totally into it. And, and, and on top of all that, Rachel is a vegan, so clearly Arthur is beginning to heal. We love character growth. More drama ensues though as Rachel and Corey begin falling in love because Corey is actually a lesbian and her immense of love was not romantic but instead platonic. But of course they both love Arthur too because he's the main character and that defies 
defies all laws of sexuality. It's kind of muddled how Corey feels about him. So they're just in a happy polyamorous situation. However, the military can't have none of them gay folk running around now, can they? So Corey's about to be discharged after being tattled on by a friend of the guy that Arthur beat up earlier for assaulting Rachel. Predictably, these bad guys come back to attempt to brutally assault both women. But in a shocking twist, Arthur dies defending them. Of course, only after taking on four men in the blink of an eye, mad lad style. Corey finishes his journal out according to his last wishes and reveals that Arthur was sexually abused by his father as a child. Yes, CSA is used as a shocking plot twist. And Corey violates his trust by sharing that in something that's apparently going to be a public document. Honestly, you might be surprised to hear that. I kind of expected this, but here's the reason. Onion writes a lot. Yeah, we're calling him Onion now. Onion writes a lot about sexual urges for no reason. And while it's because he's actually a pervert, in this narrative, it luckily translates more into a sexual fixation and hypersexuality, which are two very common symptoms of childhood sexual abuse. Not to mention, Arthur was really okay with being taken advantage of by Ashley and saw it less as a violation and more as a favor to her. And it was heavily implied that he's very detached from his own physical body, which is the messed up kind of logic many child SA victims tend to work by. Anyways, Arthur dies a martyr and the only man this lesbian has ever loved. So let's talk about all of that. <laughs> Beginning with craft related thoughts, Onion writes in a very immature way. For example, allow me to read a line I think was meant to be funny. There are fake cheeses vegans invented that taste essentially like your grandmother crapped into a jar of flour, sprayed it with a hose, put it in the oven, ran over it with her car, put it back in the oven, blended it up, put it under the sun to dry, and then slapped it on a veggie burger. Or try this one on for size. They did nothing in response. They just continued to hold their album cover pose. It was literally like each of them were trying to do their best vanilla ice impression. I didn't know whether I should laugh or face palm. Amazing. Very timely. In line with this is Onion's handling of graphic and serious topics that are thrown about as if he has no idea how to handle them with the care that they should be given. This is a very juvenile thing to do because children often don't fully understand these topics even if it's happened to them. They just know that they're bad things and therefore good plot twists for their epic Wattpad adventure romance fanfiction. I, I mean their original work that they published to Wattpad by choice. For example, the usage of child sexual assault as a plot device is really gross and using a traumatic event as a shocking twist is not advisable in any situation, but especially not one like this. Similarly, he uses sexual assault and harassment as plot motivators and major events just so his main character can carry out vigilante justice on the harassers. And while that's nice to read in any scenario and I love man-on-man -man violence, the narrative does not contemplate the assault and it seems to think that just because revenge was had, the entire thing is done and over with and we don't have to talk about it anymore. Arthur has ended rape! Jose when that's just not how it works. And instead, as a work of fiction using these topics, we should be having a discussion about why men assault women, why a woman might not fight back or tell an authority and instead just tell somebody she trusts, and why some men feel the need to enact paternalist vigilante justice the way that Arthur does. Because he is less disgusted by rapists and more disgusted by another man touching his whammon. Arthur does not really care if he can't be the hero or if he doesn't know the victim personally and therefore doesn't lay some kind of claim to them in his mind. The entire issue of using sexual assault as a plot device is very common and is the very reason I despise the novel The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo by Steg Larsson. Didn't think I'd be bringing that one up here, did you? Well, jump scare. Onion also does not utilize show don't tell and while it kind of works for the format the story is in, it makes things feel very simplistic and repetitive. Although one good thing about the style of writing is that it's very quick to get through. For a good example of how the story reads, let's look at this paragraph. Quote, After waiting for about 30 minutes outside, they directed the group of 40 or so trainees with me into a small classroom. Once we were inside, they verified our individual identities and assigned those flight numbers. After this process was complete, we were called out by the flight number we were given and from that point, we were directed to our new homes. These facilities were essentially composed of one massive room and shared with 60 other trainees. I could complain, but it was exactly what I expected. 
ended, end quote. Now this could have been expanded into a page or so and it would have been a lot more engaging to read and it would be justified to take up that much space because it's a pretty big event in Arthur's life moving into his new housing. In general, the writing needs expansion to be passable as a legit book and not as a Wattpad level pondering or just a detailed story outline. I've seriously had notes for stories that were written like this, but no actual stories that were. The content of the writing itself is very dramatic too in that juvenile way. And while our main character obviously has some mood issues that would explain a fair bit of the drama, the baseline tone of this novel is just plain aggressive and violent and it just melts into nothing but cringe by page three. Shocking content is no longer shocking when it continues page after page and the auntie is never really upped. If you wanted to write a character who, as Arthur describes himself, does not want to hurt people who don't deserve it yet still has violent intrusive thoughts and fantasies that he can't really control, then you would want to pace those thoughts out and to place them in appropriate places. Admittedly, as the book continues, this issue does get a little bit better, but for example, Arthur thinks about sticking knives in the backs of the heads of Ashley's gal pals just because he's mildly irritated at their chattering. Something like that would be better saved for a moment of extreme irritation or perhaps if they had somehow insulted some core belief of his. It would still be an overreaction to want to sucker stab them, but it would do better at cementing Arthur as someone who does not want to be violent but has issues controlling his anger, especially when he's already stressed. It really reads like Onion wanted to write lines that would make people gasp in horror, but instead he overdid it, didn't do it well, and therefore sabotaged himself. Additionally, in a journal style writing, it's hard to show rather than tell, but it is possible and has been done before, and Onion doesn't do it. It's very difficult to judge a journal because while the simplistic and surface level introspection Onion writes is realistic to how many people do think and write in their personal diaries, it's not exactly hard hitting in a fiction book and violates many rules of writing. This is a situation like the found footage film genre like I've discussed before where it almost can't be realistic and accurate to the genre it's in while also being technically good work at the same time. In general, Onion's approach to many things could have been handled a lot better too, both in terms of storytelling and characterization. For example, Arthur fantasizes about a bomb going off during a sporting event. He talks about how no one would really care after some time had passed and then goes on to talk about how athletes waste their lives playing sports. Instead of making this a show of prejudice for people Arthur doesn't like and an opportunity to say something shocking, Onion could have made this into a moment to show Arthur's philosophy on life by instead approaching it perhaps like this. Someone in class brings up this exact tragedy but weeks later no one is talking about it anymore. Arthur could notice that happened and then contemplate how depressing it is that the loss of so many human lives means so little to people after mere weeks. This would tie in really well with how he still mourns his mother's death and how he thinks all life is without purpose. He could then go on to consider why athletes play sports under the same nihilistic lens by talking about how they earn millions while they do it, but many of them go bankrupt after career ending injuries. Instead of talking down about these people he doesn't care for and cementing himself as somebody who's very immature, Arthur could have strayed closer to interpreting their lives using his personal philosophy. This would have strengthened the themes in the book and also tied together Arthur's character a bit better. Let's discuss themes. Nihilism is a complex and interesting philosophy and while it seems to be a theme here, Onion confronts it with very simplistic sentences and attempts at philosophizing that have potential but don't quite hit the mark and come off as rather superficial and meant to be shocking. I do not think at all that a pessimistic main character is automatically a bad character. But Onion's slew of mission statements about Arthur's beliefs are not not as effective or impactful of a way to portray how this character feels and thinks as could have been used. Another theme is religious trauma, which is a very real thing and feeling lost and scorned by a god you once believed in is something that a lot of people can relate to. Contrary to the radical belief that unwavering faith is the only way to worship, doubts about faith in times of struggle are a very human and common thing to feel. Arthur looks down on religious people and says things like, you know what changes things? Changing them. It sounds stupid, but prayer does not equate to changing anything outside satisfying your need to to feel like you accomplished something. While there is truth in what he says and in the toxicity of the phrase, I'll pray for you, his overall attitude makes it hard to take him seriously or see any worth in his words and Onion once again ends up sabotaging himself. Arthur also levels a lot of insults at his stepmom because he thinks of her as a poor replacement of his deceased mother instead of another human being entirely. He also believes she took advantage of his father by dating him shortly after his birth mother's death. This is actually a common way of thinking for kids in this situation, so while Arthur's misogyny misogynistic attitudes do feed into it, it's not entirely to blame on that. To quote him, she's an invader. 
She's the destroyer of what little peace I had left in my own home. Not to help that feeling at all, she's shown to be complacent in his father's physical abuse of him. Misogyny is also there from the start though, with him hating attractive women, viewing women mostly in relation to their sexual use to him, and also consistently feeding into paternalist ideas of masculinity. While on the surface, men feeling the need to protect women might not sound harmful and might instead sound actively good, and while Arthur beating up his girlfriend's harassers is a net good in the world, when you think about paternalism, you quickly realize that this pattern of thinking removes the individuality and autonomy of women, as well as rendering them less than men and that they are weaker and need protecting by a stronger force that is higher up on the social hierarchy. It is a way that many sexist men often use their prejudice to deny that exact same prejudice, and many people mistakenly think of it as a lesser evil when it comes to sexism. In this line of thought, we have a lot of incel rhetoric spouted and rewarded in the novel. To quote Arthur, as soon as the majority of straight women stop being attracted to the strongest and most ambitious males, I'll stop being one." End quote. This is a really harmful idea that a lot of men have because the reason that many straight women do end up with abusive men who fit the stereotype is because sexists have ingrained into women that you get what you get. And not only that, but a man that beats you does it because he loves you. The real alpha male here would realize this is a result of a harmful cycle of abuse and misogyny and would not feed into it by not only blaming the victims, but also by becoming the problem themselves? It's really backward. Child abuse also crops up a lot and Arthur's father is both physically and emotionally abusive to him. This is the one part of the book that was handled somewhat okay and I, I feel weird saying that and giving any credit to it. Arthur describes being around his dad as an ongoing passive aggressive battle that never ends, not to mention the line about feeling safer in juvie hall than in his own home and that he would rather join the military and potentially die in war than be at home. I've seen people point out when Arthur's parents call the cops on him for refusing to eat dinner and the cops show up and act like they'll lock him up to scare him straight and they often call this ridiculous, but I had a friend when I was younger who this exact scenario happened to. It's not unheard of in abusive homes and the unknowing cops just take it as, well, this kid needs scared straight and we don't have any white guy murders to care about right now, so why not? Resulting in the feeling Arthur has of, quote, I wasn't their child, I was a dog to them, and if I didn't obey, it was the kennels for me." End quote. Arthur also has a lot of anger and resentment for his abusers, but besides from when he is actively being abused, he is rather placid to them and keeps most of his negativity in his head. He doesn't try to start fights with them unless he's already in a bad mood or they provoke him. Not to mention, as I talked about earlier, the weirdly successful portrayal of a sexual abuse of a victim experiencing hypersexuality and detachment from one's body. Again, I really don't think Onion intended it to be that, but happy accidents do happen and to have a character who is unapologetically angry about their trauma is nice. I just wish someone else did it and also did it a lot better than Onion. But let's talk a little more about Arthur. He's the only character that really matters, so he's the only character we're going to talk about in depth. To quote him, I realize I am insignificant. Me acknowledging that is somewhat ironic considering I feel most everyone I encounter is beneath me. End quote. This attitude is actually a good indicator of Arthur's personality as well as this quote, I'd take being wrong and brave over a coward and right. My life is meaningless, but my existence can have more significance than this cowardly state if I let it. End quote. To begin simply, he is depressed, with low self-confidence and little sense of worth and very nihilistic ideas about life that are very common within depressed individuals. To quote Arthur, the more I write, the more I realize how generic and pointless my thoughts are. Sometimes the most intelligent thing you can do is acknowledged you're an idiot." End quote. Yes, it said acknowledged instead of acknowledge. He also often laments how his father's abuse makes him feel like property and like he lacks autonomy. These symptoms include a very lacking will to live too. His life is just as purposeless as everyone else's in his eyes and he sees life as monotonous and something to just go along with rather than actively participate in. He attempts to twist this into a weird hero mentality, but we'll talk about that in a second. When things don't go Arthur way or something seems to threaten him directly or indirectly, he often overreacts, whether it is violent or just self-pitying. Arthur being a teenager doesn't help this either. When someone walks in on him in the school bathroom, wiping off his skeleton makeup the day he's threatened with expulsion, he writes, I didn't have the energy to hate, only self-pity, so I stood there silently and kept wiping my face." End quote. Arthur is so consumed by his feelings over a perceived threat that he brushes the guy off when he tries to be nice to him too and continues
continues to focus on only the people who are making fun of him rather than the one person who did try to befriend him. This is a really common thing to see in depressed people because it's just much easier to accept the sad reality that you think you know than to try and focus on the positive one that challenges your beliefs. And while it seems ironic because Arthur states things like, self-assigned victims will always be victims, my hate runs deep and I can't feel sorry for people who go out of their way to feel sorry for themselves, and then does what he says, after all, he does hate himself quite a bit and does feel a lot of shame when he experiences bouts of self-loathing, at least most of the time, so it isn't entirely false, even if he is very wishy-washy. Arthur often plays victim and Onion just as often writes things so that Arthur is factually the victim. Depression is also a necessary part of narcissistic personality disorder, which does it sound hypocritical to say depression is part of narcissism? Yeah, it does, but narcissists use fake self-confidence and superiority in order to hide themselves away from their own self-loathing and general lack of confidence, as well as hiding these things from the outside world. It's an extreme case of fake it till you make it, except you never make it. To further this idea, Arthur looks down on a stereotypically attractive classmate of his and it's pretty obvious he's jealous of the attention she gets, but instead of realizing that, he funnels it into a general hatred of pretty women. You can often see him using this technique of justifying hatred of an entire group based on his jealousy for something they have that he does not. Beautiful women get attention. Fat people in his eyes are relaxed about their physical bodies in a way that Arthur is not. Religious people have had their faith rewarded when Arthur has not. Sports fans have a supportive community and easy conversation topics that he doesn't have access to. A part of this jealousy, Arthur thrives when people around him seem more miserable than he is. If he sees nothing to be jealous of, he's suddenly quite happy and grateful for his life. Overall, this book reads like a manifesto of Onion's personal beliefs, mostly because it's been discussed extensively how a lot of the things in this book line up with his own life and how the main character is a lot like him, thus the synopsis literally admitting that. Aside from that, it isn't the worst fiction I have ever read. While it is not good by any means, there is potential for a decent story to be made out of the concept and the rough plotline. And somehow, some way, I did lose more brain cells reading Fifty Shades of Grey than I did reading this. So that counts for something, I guess. But really, I wouldn't hate reading the story if it were written by someone with three brain cells to rub together instead of Onion. A very hateful, spiteful, aggressive boy experiencing a tumultuous childhood and high school life before, on a whim, deciding that the military is his escape, only to find the same old, same old there and to eventually die defending the only people that ever gave his life any meaning. That logline sounds pretty good, right? A lot would need cut out and rearranged and amended and we would really need a lot more discussion about sexual assault, trauma, masculinity, and boy-father relationships, but the content of the story itself is passable enough. It's just the actual execution. I think a better writer could craft an excellent narrative out of what's here, but Onion just isn't that writer and this entire thing reads like a first draft that was posted to Wattpad.com. The countless spelling errors do not help that feeling, although the grammar is okay. So, I mean, there's a lot of spelling errors, but the grammar's okay. I would have started a counter, but I thought of doing it on page 60 and I didn't feel like giving it that much effort. Onion also tries to give Arthur a pretty distinct voice, but it ends up being way overdone and at times outright offensive. There's like two, three actual slurs in this, so there's that. You can make an unlikable main character, but they have to be complex and interesting to make up for the lack of relatability or their general distastefulness. And again, Onion isn't an experienced writer who's capable of crafting a character like that. Honestly, I'm just surprised that it wasn't as bad or as incompetent as I thought it was based on other videos I've watched about it. And while I'm not exactly glad I read it for myself, I hope this video does numbers so I can at least justify the learning experience somehow. But I hope you enjoyed this video anyways. If you've watched this long, then I really appreciate it and I won't keep you much longer. This was a lot of time and effort to make and a lot of brain cells to lose, so a like or a comment or a subscribe is always appreciated. If you want to give me money so I can go buy a Stephen King audiobook and recover from this tragedy, then my Etsy, Depop, or Teespring stores are great ways to do that. I switched from Redbubble to Teespring, Redbubble sucks, and Spring is way nicer and lets me have more controls, so I like it better so far. We'll see how things shake out in the long run. As always, thank you so much for watching. Auf Wiedersehen.